title of the um, topic, which is Adapting and Thriving in the New Tourism of Reality. Um, in a moment, we'll unshare that and you'll actually see the beautiful faces of our panelists and it will be more live and more interactive that way. Um, but before we start, because this is a webinar format for the first time that we've had in the social hour, um, want to make sure that if you have I'm sure everyone's an expert on Zoom already, if not, just in case. Um, feel free to continue chatting if you want in the chat box. Um, but if you have any questions at all, feel free to actually use the Q&A box and forward those questions on. And we will have some time to um, answer the questions that you may have for our panelists as well. Um, without further ado, um, I do know that Seth has a quick moment to talk about why we've started the social hour. So over to you, Seth. Yeah, thanks, Connie. Uh, you know, we know one of the things that we we we've really tried to do as, as a group here and, and uh, you know, as Tourism Burnaby is to, you know, give that, um, have that connection to not only our community, but the, you know, the greater community at, at large. And, you know, we've done these social hours now, this is actually week six. And, uh, you know, we've learned, you know, a lot, a lot during, uh, you know, during this, um, you know, this kind of six week journey. And, and I think, um, you know, we're, we're trying different things and, you know, we, we want to make sure that, were you know essentially being a service for people during during kind of these tough times, um, and you know I I think one of the things that I just want to share quickly is you know I appreciate all our hotel partners that are still working really hard, you know every day and you know for us you know we 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 do understand times are difficult right now and um, you know hope and I, as as a group and you know even as as the advisory group we are very um, happy that you you know a lot of you will join us and. And, 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 and I think um, that's really kind of the, the message I want to share. And I appreciate the five panelists that are, that are joining us today. Um, and one quick note, just so that, you know, before I throw it back to Connie here and I'll um, take off this first screen is if you do have questions, please put it in a Q and A. Um, we do have an option of putting you into a, a voice question. So if you do have a question, either send me a message through chat or send a, send a message through the uh, chat and I will put you on to uh, a voice question. So uh, yeah, Connie, do you wanna uh, take it away? Awesome, thank you so much, Seth. Um, so wow, you can see my face now. <laughs> um, okay, so the topic is adopting and thriving in the new tourism. And before we go there, we'd love for each of the panelists to really self-introduce yourself and really help us understand your current position and how the COVID-19 has impacted your business, as well as how you have pivoted or flex um, because of that impact. So we'll start with maybe Chris first. For sure. Okay, uh, so hello everyone. I know many of you on the call today. I'm uh, the executive director for Tourism Burnaby. And uh, as with all of us on the call, we've been deeply affected by uh, COVID-19. Um, my organization in particular is supported primarily by a hotel tax, which with um, nobody staying in hotels is challenging and made further so by uh, the fact that uh, the provincial government has, uh, has allowed um, our accommodations providers to uh, hold on to the or defer payment of the tax until later this year, uh, which is which has defunded our uh, our organization. Uh, fortunately, we're in a position uh, with reserves where we can continue continue operations and we can do exciting things like this call. But it's definitely uh, as far away from uh, business as usual as I could have possibly imagined two or three months ago. So, in terms of, of what we do, everything has changed for us. Our KPIs, which were primarily room nights before, that's those will come back, but for the time being, we've really had to uh, pivot and change what we're doing as a tourism agency. And instead of looking outwards and trying to bring in uh, uh, tourists and uh, business travelers, sports tournaments, that kind of thing to the, the city in the short term, we've really had to focus on how do we support our stakeholders? How do we keep those businesses that are still open, open? Uh, whether it be hotels or working with our restaurants to find, uh, you know, to help them make those changes to uh, delivery and, and takeout options and, uh, and whatnot. So it's been, uh, uh, you know, obviously a really interesting few weeks and also uh, moving out of our, uh, our regular offices to being home-based and conducting most of our, uh, our business on Zoom. So I'm sure not too different from, from many of you, but each of us has our unique island, I guess, that, uh, that we're living on right now as we continue, so. Awesome, thank you, Chris. Um, and over to you, Beth. Well, hi, good afternoon, everybody. And who'd imagine we'd be where we are today, March you know, 23rd, just several weeks ago. 
Um, life has changed and I don't know if it'll ever change back again. We're truly in a place of uncertainty. I am the CEO with Tourism Canlips. I've been in the tourism industry over 35 years from uh, retail to franchising all over the place. And I've, if you ever would have told me that I would have spent any part of my career telling people to stay at home, uh, that's probably <laughs> the biggest shift for, for me right now. Um, tourism Kamloops, uh, you know, we are in an enviable position, same as Tourism BC, in that we kind of plan for a rainy day, and right now we are in the middle of a tornado, and, uh, and those reserves will come in handy. We are about 80 to 85% funded through MRDT funds, and so that's that hotel tax that uh, Chris was, was referring to. Uh, the rest of it is city and some other, um, other revenue-generating opportunities. We uh, had started YK Strong with our business community here. We felt that there was so much information coming to our business community that Tourism Countless could really become a leader in the community and speak to and be that source of information within. And it's really uh, grown legs and um, to the point that, you know, they're even mentioning it at City Hall during council meetings and stuff on how, you know, we've really stepped up and not just with the tourism community, but to be responsible and a resource for our entire community. We really, our messaging right now is to stay at home, stay safe, and really support local wherever, wherever we can. Um, we are, you know, looking at virtual experiences with the BC Wildlife Park and wine tasting, a lot of, of what some other DMOs are doing, and we're just looking for any way to engage and keep Kamloops top of mind for when it is safe and um, responsible to start inviting people back into our community. We have to make sure that we're honoring our social responsibility and that we're taking care of the people and the, and the, the natural resources that we have. I think Kamloops is very well positioned for recovery as we are a drive market, we're a smaller center, or even our brand speaks to no crowds. So we're really looking forward to the time when we can start to invite people back into our community. And I think we're, we're well aligned to welcome guests back sooner than later. So thank you for your time today, everyone. Thank you, Bev. And over to Christina. Hi, good afternoon, everyone. Um, I'm Christina Northcott. I'm the Senior Manager of Conference and Events at Canada Health Employee. So uh, I'm gonna speak to two different worlds. Um, in my events role, things have obviously, like many, dramatically changed. Um, and so we're currently um, refocusing and re, uh, redesigning how events were once uh, operated at Canada Health Employee. Um, in my other world, uh, Canada Health InfoWay is a digital healthcare organization funded by the federal government. And we've been working to roll out digital health solutions for Canadians for the last uh, 15 plus years. And that adoption dramatically uh, increased in the matter of a week. So our organization is incredibly busy funding projects across the country. Um, and now as my job as an event planner, it's to ensure that those conversations and those meetings are still taking place, but now in the virtual format that we're living in so um, yeah my other worlds exist I'm the VP uh, with the MPI Toronto chapter um, so busy here supporting our members in Toronto um, and reaching out in that format as well I'm a board member with meetings means business Canada so some work right now happening on the advocacy side with government um, and what we can do to support um, our members there as well so Thank you, Christina. It's a lot on your plate right now with lots of changes and pivoting. Um, and over to you, Tiff. Great, thanks very much. Uh, again, I'm Tiff Daniels with Outback Team Building and Training. Uh, I've been with the organization for uh, over 17 years now. We've been around for 25 years. When I joined, we were very much a, a destination bricks and mortar style uh, activity provider. We did whitewater rafting, we did uh, corporate ski trips, and we did some team building activities where people came to us uh, to be executed and we discovered uh, back in 08 when the recession hit then that we had to diversify and make programs that were scalable and executionable uh, to, in, to any location and from that actually we started then expanding across Canada and into the US and uh, have now become very much an international team building and training supplier and um, 
even a couple years ago, we, we developed an app that enabled us to execute a proprietary program for people to execute in their location without us physically coming on site. And then about six months ago, even before COVID, we decided to do some video virtual team building whereby you might have a, a group in a boardroom at a hotel and rather than us fly in or show up on site, we would get on the monitor on the video screen and be the, the facilitator or, ex or help execute the program uh, on site for, for the group. And so obviously when everything, uh, when the, this all started to occur, uh, our in-person meetings went from uh, quite a bit to basically zero as we're all discovering. But we're lucky enough to be able to take some of the things we learned from doing these virtual team building programs to the group and now pivot so it's virtual team building to multiple participants as we are doing right now, where everyone's sitting at their home, potentially some individuals at a, a standalone office, but that's where we've been able to pivot to. Our only challenge though is that because of uh, this is very new for so many people and so many organizations, they're still trying to learn how to uh, experience this new way of communicating and new way of getting together. So the first few weeks we were scrambling, we've been using Zoom uh, internally for a number of years and externally for about six months, but we then suddenly realized there's all these providers that are using MS Teams, they're using Citrix, they're using WebEx, they're using a multitude of video conferencing tools and every day we have a customer say, oh, how about you use this one? And that then becomes a new challenge for us because how do we then uh, help that customer execute them uh, when we're working with them? So that, that's a new learning uh, aspect for us. But um, yeah, so we're all, we're all learning something new every day. I'm, I'm interested in, in some of the questions and discussions we'll have and uh, I'm really glad to be here. Thank you very much. Great, thank you so much, Tiff. And over to you, Greg. Hi there, everyone. Uh, thank you for having me, Tourism Burnaby. <clears throat> so I work with MMGY Next Factor. We work with Destinations International, which is the International Trade Association for uh, tourism boards uh, like Tourism Burnaby. And we put together something called Destination Next, which is probably the most <clears throat> high level sort of overview of trends driving the global visitor economy. So when COVID happened, we started talking with every uh, tourism board leader we can uh, could across North America. And just yesterday, we launched something called Organization Next on uh, Destination International's uh, CEO call. And it's really a short-term strategic plan for tourism boards over the next six to 18 months. And it's really this idea that no one has any resources anymore. All of a sudden, there's all this new demands on the organization. So how do we work with uh, directors and stakeholders and boards of directors to really identify and prioritize uh, what strategies can be done? That's the short term. On the long term, uh, working with Destination Canada and other organizations for five to 10 year overarching destination master plans, working with Destination Canada now. And it's really how will destinations differentiate themselves and leverage the creativity and innovation in their communities, where community is really the brand experiences are commodities. It's the people behind those experiences and the creativity and innovation aligned with sort of big picture themes. I'm a Canadian citizen living in the U.S. and a friend of mine said, uh, you know, when you look at Canada, there's not a lot there that we can't find in the U.S. If you're showing mountains and streams and craft beer trails, we can find all that in Colorado or Pittsburgh. It has to be about ideas. It has to be about feelings. Right. And so how, what does that actually look like and how can destinations sell that and capture that um, in their communities? Uh, so that's sort of a rough overview of what I do. Excellent. Thank you so much, Greg. Um, so we'll jump right into the first question for the panel. And it's as we discover our new normal, what is your advice and how we should adapt to those changes? So you mentioned some of the things that you're currently doing with each of your businesses, but as advice to the audience and the attendees that's on the call right now, how should we adapt um, to what's happening to us right now? Anyone want to jump in or should I pick someone? <laughs> no, I can start just to get the ball rolling. So, you know, having spoken with Tourism board, and I'll use tourism board versus DMO or what have you, because I'm not sure if everyone's familiar with the, the language, but um, no one knows what 
step, you know, what foot to put forward right now. There was the initial triage um, where everyone was, had to let go of people and sort of pool resources and, and start driving business continuity to local restaurants. But now as we sort of move from response to recovery, um, there's, there's a lot of question marks. So we look to destinations that are doing it well um, in the U.S., we look at Fort Worth that came right out in early March and because of the strength they had and the, the relationships they had in their community, we were able to come out with um, a lot of different types of content to support local businesses, local creatives, um, because there have already sort of been at the forefront of this idea of aligning government, tourism and community leaders around um, sort of shared goals and values. In Canada, you look at Victoria, Canada, phenomenal job between Mayor Lisa Helps with her Victoria 3.0 economic development plan and what um, Paul Nursey is doing there with Greater Destination Victoria um, and then Victoria Clark uh, out in St. John, um, Newfoundland. She, uh, she actually had their non-tourism industry come to her, the shipping company, there's a big logistics shipping industry there. And they said, we want to work with you. And they came up with this idea of putting a bunch of shipping containers on the dock to use as kind of a backdrop for drive-in movies. Uh, so, but they came to her, which just speaks a lot to that community building that's already happened. What's happening now, we're seeing other communities are really starting to, because they're focusing so much more on their local residents, are starting to establish and expand those networks, um, either maintaining what they have or more likely building on um, what is already there. And then thinking about how they can leverage that to sort of position um, the destination moving forward. Thank you. Bad for Chris or Christina or Tiff, would you like to add to that? in terms of your advice and how we should adopt the changes? Yeah. Um, oh, sorry, go ahead, Jeff. Sorry, I, I was gonna just add to that in the sense that, um, you know, you're, I think what Greg was saying, a lot of alignment between different sectors and, and uh, different uh, industries. And in the last few days, because I, I was saying a lot of our team building programs are, are scalable and modifiable to any location, we've been reaching out to a lot of bricks and mortar or, or destination specific team building providers and activity providers to see if we can work together to help their customers or vice versa. Maybe they have some ideas that, um, that we can help each other on. So I think it's kind of the same ideas. How do you go out to the community and the industry and work together to, uh, with a common goal of trying to all survive and try to find some solutions to uh, what the next reality is going to be? Yeah, Thanks, and, I, and Chris, go ahead, sorry. sorry. I'm chomping at the bit here. Um, no, this is just to, to kind of also say, to kind of add what um, uh, Tiff and Greg were saying as well. Uh, Mike Tyson famously said, everyone's got a plan until they get punched in the face. And, uh, and I think that's really what's happened to us. And what's made us realize at Tourism Burnaby are all the holes in our organizations, all the things that like we thought we were marketing geniuses for the last six years in this economy, but that's not the case. And we realize that we have opportunities that we've missed in connecting with different stakeholders. So whether that be, you know, being on a first name basis with all the restaurateurs in town, or whether it be, uh, you know, having conducted research so that we can really speak to the true value of tourism within our communities. Those are things that are missing that we're going to have to uh, really focus on in the, you know, in the coming months. And I don't think any of us are coming out of this unscathed, but nobody's coming out of this alone. So really in the next uh, few uh, weeks and months and hopefully not years, uh, it's really gonna be about uh, building those partnerships in our community so we stay strong because we didn't, uh, we certainly didn't have our, our shipping uh, community come to us and offer to set up a drive-in in Burnaby. So we've got some work to do. I think, I think too that um, this new next normal, whatever that is, is also, there could be so many distractions out there. I'm sure, you know, everyone on this call has been told in one way or another what we should be considering, what we should be doing. And one of the, I've kind of been in this industry a long time. It seems everything affects this industry, whether it's SARS, H1N1, a freaking volcano in Iceland. I mean, it's just, it's just nonstop and you learn to be an amazing problem solver. But one of the things I've, I've learned over the years is to be able to be flexible and there are no sacred cows. And so, you know, what was your normal six weeks ago truly is not now. And every time something like this has happened in my career, we've come out of it at least with nuggets of 
betterness for lack of a better word and and um, we need to be open to that but I think at the same time there's a lot of distractions out there so you need to be very very firm on what your purpose is and not get distracted into you know what other people are doing it has to work for you it has to work for your destination and your stakeholders and your partners and stay focused but at the same time be willing to pivot and look at all areas of your business and and like you were saying Chris is listen to your stakeholders in your community because they are coming to you with problems and it's really easy to be um, you know super popular when life is good and the money's flowing and visitors are coming and business is thriving but you can really shine when the you know what hits the fan and you're standing out there supporting your community and truly being that advocate for what business needs not simply in the tourism sector but those second and third sectors as well that that do support our industry so um, those are those are my big learnings is be flexible but at the same time know your role and know your purpose excellent thank you so much bed and christina did you want to add anything to that question yeah i think that you kind of the same thing is just you know as a planner you know we like to have things pretty lined up and forecasting and, and predicting what the future looks like is, is one of our, our main skill sets i think but this is a time of, of absolute flexibility and just kind of rolling with it um you know for the planners that are on the call and, and i think it's just understanding still what your core business objectives are or in any business what your core business and how are you going to be able to deliver um to what your your organization or your stakeholders need so whether it be networking or education or thought leadership that you know you're looking to have you can still by you know you can adapt and you can deliver those still those business objectives but it just you know in a flexible different uh format than what you may be used to normally have done so not trying to replicate anything but being um, a little innovative and trying it in different ways so Thank you, Christina. Thank you everyone for the first round of questions. We'll move on to the next one. And there's a trend out there right now, and most of you mentioned it in your responses. And right now, basically, we see a lot of um, sharing between similar businesses, reaching out and sharing best practices, and hey, what are you doing? And, and how can we adapt those same best practices? Um, can you share any insights in terms of how you are sharing your knowledge with um, different business sectors or similar business sectors um, currently? Should we start with maybe Greg again? Okay, so all of our work is transparent and public and we're sharing that with everyone, but any kind of strategies we come up with have been co-created with um, tourism leaders nationwide. So it's all about building consensus, um, seeing what's worked for a lot of different communities, trying to establish some commonalities, and then um, you know, putting that out toward the industry. For example, you have the tourism leaders in Portland, San Francisco, and Seattle working with their state leaders to um, really sort of cross promote each other. If everyone's going to be driving um, all, you know, for the first year perhaps, um, how can they work together to cross promote how people should drive through the organization or through the area? I brought the same up with uh, Seth uh, a couple days ago and Nancy Small in Richmond, the same idea that it's not just collaboration within the city but across cities. So how can um, what's working in one city help um, potentially what's uh, working in another city. For example, you have uh, in Victoria the food eco district where it's a very sort of package and promotion of the entire supply chain and a circular economy and it's, it's pretty cool. So how could that potentially help all of the food industries um, and supply chains and all the other destinations package that for people that are driving around and everyone kind of sort of build on each other's knowledge. So we're trying to find um, examples like that that destinations can start looking at right out of the box for the first customers that are coming. Chris? Okay, <laughs> yeah, you see me <laughs> leaning in here? Uh, well, no, I was thinking just in sharing in general. Like, so if we look at the, the, the great financial crisis back in 2008, 2009, really this, this new modern sharing economy kind of grew out of that saying, I've got you know, five hours between dinner and bedtime and, and a car in the driveway, voila, Uber. Um, you know, I've got a roommate and I can't make rent, but we've got this couch, Airbnb is born. Um, and so I think that out of necessity, we just kind of look at, you know, what do we have lying around here? And I think as destinations and hotels and, you know, just in, in general, we're going to kind of have to take a, a closer look at that and how we can share that out. Meaning, 
uh, let's say I've got, you know, different organizations within the city that I know are going for retreats elsewhere. Well, I've kind of left them untouched because, you know, they're not going to meet in Burnaby. That's not super helpful to, to my stakeholders, but mm, I bet they'd love to go up to Kamloops for a retreat and Bev, maybe you've got a, a meeting or, or two that uh, needs to come down uh, towards uh, Metro Vancouver. So I think those, those partnerships and potentially sister cities, especially as we get move towards uh, just that, that regional travel and those, those road trips rather than long haul air are gonna be really, really important as we enter the first stages of recovery here. Thank you. Bev or Christina or Tiff, would you like to add to that question? Yeah, I mean, mine really come down to, I just feel the, you know, the word task force and committees is just popping up everywhere. I think that, you know, on all levels, um, these little, you know, task force and committees are being created to, to kind of share information and, and solve problems quickly. So I think, you know, that's, the, that's one of the new buzzwords we're hearing when it, and I think of like tools that, you know, within my, uh, my associations were using things like MPI Global has made all of their education um, offerings available to anybody. You don't have to be a member right now. So that's just a, 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 an easy resource that people can reach out just for further professional development. Um, things like MPI Toronto have created online forums where um, all members have access to a, 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 you know, a group chat that you can share information, whether you're a supplier, planner, or, or looking for, um, recommendations or best advice. So I think those those tools that we're creating and webinars and stuff like that are just are the, the essential tools to kind of getting that information out there and sharing what's happening in the moment. Thank you. And Bev or Tiff, would you like to add to the question of um, shared insights or additional examples of what you're able to do? So what, you know, we look to, um, you know, we're, we're cam loops. We don't have these massive resources and, and research data and things. We, we work closely with Greg and his team um, on, on the strategy piece. But I find I, I, you know, have always liked to draft behind bigger organizations, Destination Canada, Destination BC for here, for here in British Columbia. And, um, you know, organizations, you know, really aligning ourselves with those industry organizations like TIA BC, TIAC. BC DMOA, it, it, these folks have relative information to at least our world. And um, what we find is, you know, they're the ones that can expend the most energy and resources towards some of these recovery or, or situations that we find ourselves in right now. So whatever that we determine is relevant to Camlips, we will draft behind what they're doing as opposed to recreating and, and spending limited resources we have. So we always look to those that are doing things already. Um, we like to be considered leaders, but we will lead in our community um, with those that make sense for us and use the resources and draft behind those that have greater resources, but literally aligned um, uh, objectives and goals. And I found that's really bode well for us over, over time and the best utilization of our resources. Great. Thank you. And Tiff? Yeah. Um, you know, I, I manage a, a group of sales team, uh, a sales uh, team and, Regrettably, it's a lot smaller th today than it was uh, six weeks ago. Um, but uh, we, we, even though they're sales, they're sales representatives, we, we call them engagement consultants because that's ultimately what we're trying to, uh, to provide our customers and an engaging experience that uh, creates alignment and, and helps them as an organization. But my, my most senior representative uh, engagement consultant uh, he's a, a fantastic individual and he always talks about the law of reciprocity. And that's, I think what a lot, I'm hearing from a lot of people here is you, you're giving something, not necessarily because you expect something back, but if you do give something, you probably will get something back. Even if it's for free, you're not going to get any get gainfully anything out of it immediately. And I think that's what kind of situation we're in right now. And a, a common sort of thread I'm hearing from people is that, You've got to help others and in, in in due course that'll help you and it'll help everybody and help the community so the law of reciprocity is something i'm thinking a lot about today and it's just uh trying to, to help our partners and our customers um get through this and try to find solutions i mean the whole canadian destination canada's whole new brand for glowing hearts is completely baked in that idea of reciprocity 
and that visitors come to Canada benefit in the process, but also Canadians in that interaction, or whether it's province to province, everyone's benefiting in that um, engagement. And so how do you steward that? And how do you connect communities in a more intentional way, perhaps? And how do you start looking at your the people and the ideas and this idea that tourism is, and this is from Destination Canada, tourism is the sharing economy of ideas. How do you start promoting that and, and selling that, marketing that, um, versus just your experiences, spaces, places, that kind of thing. So I think this idea of reciprocity is something that would be great for all of us to really think about more and talk about more in the future. And, and if you don't mind me just adding to that, Greg, as well, is the idea is people talk about within organizations, silos, and the same thing can happen, not just within a organization, but between these organizations, because obviously with throughout our country and others that, that you have these organizations that have their own responsibilities for their destination, but really they should be sharing or trying to figure out how to share that information, those experiences you just address more so, so they're not living in their, that silo. Yeah, 100%. Yeah. Great points, thank you. Um, we're gonna actually go into the next question and it's really about the, so the question is understanding the impact of COVID-19 in a regional and global level how do you see the events and meeting being executed? So we know that COVID impacts each city, each community very differently and the rates in terms of who is confirmed or who has been recovered were all different. So for example, in Ontario, we're right now about 5,000 cases. Actually, I had some numbers here. I did have some numbers. <laughs> Anyhow, um, we'll ignore that for a sec. So for example, right now, in, if we look at the picture of Canada, there is about, um, in Quebec is our highest province in terms of the impact of COVID being about 20,000 people having COVID. And then in Ontario is the next highest impact. And when we look at BC, you're less than 2,000 people impacted. So there's a big variance in terms of how um, COVID has impacted you, but at the end of the day, we're all doing social distancing. And when we need to be ready to plan events again, how do you see us starting those baby steps in terms of planning what the future looks like? Because everyone's future may start at different time frames because our impacts are different um, from a regional and a global perspective. Did I run on too much? <laughs> So just to reframe the question again, it's um, so understanding the impact of COVID-19 um, in different regions and global level, how do you see events and meetings being executed? Christina, do you want to jump into this one? Because I know you have your planner hat on. Sure. Yeah, um, I, I think, you know, there, there's certainly a lot of hesitation when that day will come and, and myself being based in Toronto and Ontario and my organization being spread across the country, it's going to create a lot of challenges. Um, and not just internally, but externally, what are our stakeholders and their uh, rules and regulations going to be around travel in the future? And on an individual level, what is the comfort level, um, whether your, your physical or your family um, implications of, of you traveling? Um, so you know, it's going to take a lot of time. Um, it's not going to go back to business as usual for a very, very long time. So. Um, to speak in, in, um, in the distant future, I see small gatherings um, at local levels. I still see um, heavy use of digital technology, creating satellite locations potentially to connect people still on that national or potentially international level. Um, lots of different you know, features certainly going to be taken into consideration. I know all the hotel partners are currently coming up with their manuals um, of what that looks like. And I, I, you know, seen some of those and they're sharing those now about how new room setups and, you know, physical distancing can take place still in those setups. Um, you know, new positions for traffic control cops um, in meetings and venues, um, the flow of traffic. Um, there will be legal implications, and, and Greg, maybe you see this more in the states than in Canada. But you know, will we all be signing waivers before we step into a venue? Because we could be putting our, you know, nobody wants to take on the risk of liability, or as a meeting planner, a professional, um, 
what's my risk or liability if somebody does become infected or a spread happens. So, you know, lots of, lots of more tactical things for sure from the venue side, but those are some of the big things and considerations in the future that I've, I've been thinking about. Yeah, and from the hotel side, what we've heard Hilton and Marriott are, and it's a few other brands, are unwilling to say that people have to wear masks like JetBlue just came out with recently. But at the same time, everyone kind of sees that's where we're going. And all the conversations with all the different organizations, the big black hole or the big meetings, when are they coming back? And we're, you know, people are talking in terms of, of years. So again, everyone's looking at the short meetings, regional meetings, smaller meetings. Um, and the, a lot of talk about the digital side. And just as a case study, I was, we had to go to South by Southwest a couple of months ago. They canceled a, um, a week before. Now, what they did a couple of weeks later, they said, well, defer your payment and you can have next year for free and half for the next year. They could have kept half of my money, which is about $1,400, if they would have shared the content they had because all the decks were prepared, all the speakers were ready to go. It was all this content that I could use, some fascinating stuff. So there was money left on the table. Now, I can't speak for South by. Um, it's a fantastic organization. Maybe it was too much to turn around in a short time frame, but there was a lot of money um, that they could have had. Now, you look at City Nation Place, which is another event. Uh, was in West Hollywood last year. I went to that, paid $800. It was supposed to be in Toronto this year. They pivoted and said, look, can you? we want to keep half of your money. We want to keep $400, and we're going to put on um, the show and all the people in Toronto that were involved are going to stay involved. And it's going to be very interesting to see, that's next week or the week after, how that is being put together. And as having paid for that, there's certain expectations. It's definitely not about the experience, right? It's about custom content and I can help co can I help co-create the event, which is happening, and really start customizing the journey through that event and really elevate the ROI. So just this idea that hybrid meetings or virtual technology, there could be something that we could look at as an industry to drive some revenue. It will never, not compete with face-to-face -face at all, but there are opportunities there. Um, I think I might just uh, add as well. So prior to being with Tourism Burnaby, I worked in, in group sales for hotels for about 15 years with Marriott and Fairmont and Pan Pacific. And I have a couple of concerns as we move forth into meetings. So for meetings to be viable, a lot of it is, is volume based. And so if you're looking at, you know, a space, a meeting space that was designed for 40 people, but you can now really only facilitate 10 in it and respect social distancing, that's a bit of a challenge. So creating that profitability. And then in terms of what's that experience look like for them? So are people coming into the room sitting at rounds of three instead of rounds of 10? Are they sitting classroom style? Uh, and then for the dining experience, are they just picking up prepackaged meals on the side? Because I think, you know, the days of buffets are gone and handshakes are out of here. So how do we, what's that experience look like that makes people actually want to meet, uh, you know, in the future? And then that, that's something that I'm kind of struggling with every day. It's like, is it, is, is there any benefit to meeting in person right now versus a Zoom call? And what's, what's that going to, what's that going to look like in the, in the coming weeks? And then the solvency issues, right? If you can only bring half the people back or restaurants, if you can only operate half capacity, you can't remain viable. The mar yeah. you know, margins aren't there. So what does that mean long-term? So it's a big question. Yeah. Lots to think about for sure. Um, does anyone else want to add to that or we can move on to the next question? We're good, okay. Um, so the next question is, in order to thrive with the new normal, whenever that's gonna become, um, what are the recommended training strategies that we should consider? Um, especially when we think about currently when we're ready to go back into the business, there's a lot of employees that needs to be onboarded again. And when they're onboarded, there's a lot of new training in terms of the standards of social distancing, the safety measures and the cleaning processes. What should that look like? And what are the strategies that we should recommend for everyone that's listening today? Okay, I can start just quickly. Um, there's no money, there's no one traveling and the return is gonna be slow and there's gonna be just insane competition for a very limited pool of customers. And those customers are gonna have not as much money as they once did. 
So what do you have? You have a lot of ideas and knowledge. You look at um, uh, Burnaby, sorry, I went to BCIT. You have Simon Fraser. You have incredible ideas and energy and innovation and creativity. Um, Kamloops, there's the Innovation Lab. And having been there, um, there's this young, vibrant energy to, to do something amazing. Um, in, in Richmond, that, that whole Steveston area and what they're doing around sustainability and food, just like Victoria, um, and then Victoria's Economic Development Plan, this whole idea of wrapping a city and the whole southwestern BC uh, in terms of a connected ecosystem that really has a lot of global fluency. You got all these brains, so I think now is the time to start really connecting those and business development starts happening and partnerships start happening uh, when you start bringing really smart and innovative people together. So I would just say that's like step one, which everyone can start today, like you're doing now. I think when we start to onboard again or re-onboard, you know, uh, it's, it's a matter of doing more with less. And so traditional roles within your organization is having the conversations with your folks internally and saying, we now need you to do these things. And so there's a lot of free training out there to Christina's point, you even on the MPI front, but there's a lot of resources out there. And so, you know, it, it's not going to, we're not going to have the funds to use consultants like we did in the past or agencies like we did in the past. We're going to have to do a lot of this work with the resources that we have at least for the next few years. So for us, it will be personal development on expanding your existing role, talents and skill so that we can um, maintain business and we can uh, continue to market um, and you utilize those, those existing resources in, in different ways and cross training and consolidating roles. Um, for instance, our, our graphic designer has never edited video really before to speak of and we gave her some B-roll for this specific video we needed and um, my God, I was totally blown away. So there's hidden talents within. So although we won't have this huge budget for professional development moving forward, I think there are opportunities to invest in the people that we have now do more with less and really encourage them to stretch themselves like we're all having to stretch to go beyond what their traditional roles are into into new roles that will um, support sustainability of our industry. That's a great response, Beth. Chris, did you want to say something? Uh, yeah, I just wanted to say like, I mean, this is we're definitely in, in uncharted waters. I don't, I, I, that's, that's in my, I've, Two, uh, two phrases that are in the drinking games I play on these calls. One of them is pivot and the other is uncharted waters. So if you're drinking at home, go ahead. Um, but one of the things that I, I think that, we, that this does have in common with prior downturns is the recovery does share, share some commonalities. So the things that you do when you're coming out of a downturn is you focus on maintaining those clients that you already have, stealing share from your competitors and then building loyalty. So during this downtime, I think those are key things that you want to be just really understanding. Loyalty, uh, what it is to, to bring those people, and then understanding who those first travelers are going to be back. Uh, and it's not going to be business travelers. It's going to be leisure travelers. It's going to be Generation Z, who are or Z, uh, who are attracted by the lower price points of travel in a, in a way that they haven't been before. Uh, and the boomers, like, uh, like my mom. My mom was about to go on a round-the-world cruise and she canceled it in the second week of March. So those boomers have got stuff on their bucket list they want to get done. And uh, they're going to they're gonna be back out there and they've got the, the funds to do it. So uh, I think those organizations that understand that, that demographic shift and, uh, and those different types of business are the ones that are going to flourish in the, uh, in the new reality. Great. Thank you, Chris. Uh, Christina or Tiff? Yeah, yeah. To, to add to, I think Beverly was talking about um, uh, utilizing, utilizing resources to cross train through different departments. I mean, I know within our organization, we're seeing that we're probably going to have to do that. But the other part, too, is in other organizations that there might be people that aren't even on site to train the people, uh, the people with the skill set to train those on site might be at a different location. So just like we're doing now, I think video training and vi could uh, increase and then with that what are the intricacies of the video uh, training you know you don't have the social cues the body language isn't as, as notice noticeable people potentially if you're training a number of people in one room at the same time 
they could be, get distracted. You've got to deal with how to, to, to do that type of, or have that type of training moving forward. And maybe there's different type of sort of uh, compliance or testing or different methodologies going to be used if you're not physically on site or not able to walk people through exact examples of whatever you're trying to train them on. So a different way of, of uh, education moving forward. Christina, did you want to add to that or should Yeah, yeah no, it's, a, it's the same stuff. And Bev, you made a great point. I mean, as planners, you know, my organization, we're fortunate to still be employed, but it is a case of, of being uh, flexible and willing to take on different roles. And, you know, there's lots of amazing skill sets in this industry and, and project management and, and leadership and, um, you know, communications are, are all skill sets that we have to do our daily jobs. And those are skill sets that are still being needed and for other, other roles. And so just being flexible to, to take on whatever it is that comes up and, and looking at it really as a learning and development opportunity for your own self pers personally and professionally, um, you know, kind of going with it and, and, and making the best of that. Thank you, Christina. Um, really, really great responses. Very inspired in terms of all the strategies and tactics and ways that we should think and move forward. So thank you very much, everyone. Uh, we're going to open up the Q&A to, um, to the attendees right now. And Seth, I believe you have um, a couple individuals that have indicated that they have a question. Yeah, I'm, I'm going to just pass it off to um, first. I'm going to pass it off to Jane. And then uh, Vivian had a question. And I, and I believe uh, Hafiz had a question as well. So I'm going to give. Jane, the floor here. Jane, can you uh, hear us? Yes, I can. If, if, um, I actually had attended a webinar a few weeks ago, earlier on in, in the whole uh, course of events here, with the Urban Land Institute, and it was with the uh, tourism representatives from Cascadia. And one of the things that seemed to um, kind of filter up to the top was that and granted, this was a couple of weeks ago, that for the future traveling public, whether it be um, business or um, otherwise, is that safety is going to be more important than price. And so I just wanted to find out what your thoughts, you have touched on it a little bit already, but what your thoughts are on this. Well, I can go. Um, you know, when we had a, a full day strat session yesterday about scenario one, when we do start, you know, slowly local start movement within the area to begin that recovery, what are they looking for? And what are those touch points? So for instance, wine tasting, um, how do you, you know, you can see in front where the, you know, the people might be using gloves or there might be masks on or whatever as people start to move, those, those sorts of visual things. But what's happening behind the scenes before you get that glass? Like what happens with the wine bottles? And, you know, we're kind of going to be coming out in paranoia on, you know, we don't want to be the person that starts this in our area all over again. And so I think there is going to be a, a real push towards speaking to the traveling public and to the locals about about cleanliness and we used to talk about the path to purchase but maybe it's the path to re-exploring and you know a hotel room do you do you touch the remote control do you come in there with your Lysol wipes do you bring your own pillow like what does that look like and I think those are very real concerns and before we start marketing beautiful landscapes and pretty pictures we do have to address the reality of the situation and the scope of what we've just come out of because it's been traumatic and people are going to be afraid. The other thing too is we need to have conversations with our community about welcoming visitors back into our community and you know what it looks like to go to a gas station and what does it look like to open up a restaurant and and the social distancing. These it's going to be a different sort of initial marketing and I don't know Greg if you I'm sure you guys have talked about it but it's, I don't believe it's going to be pretty pictures and landscapes and sunsets of couples holding hands walking down the river. It's going to be very much, what are you, what are you doing to make sure I'm safe? Right. So we're all sort of trust merchants now. And the number one thing is that, you know, customers trust us. And when, you know, the, the head of BC Health says it's okay to, for restaurants to open, that'll go a long way. And then restaurants and hotels will show what they're doing, um, both in the physical 
environment and online. We'll all be traveling with, you know, big science bags of cleaning products, um, most likely. But coming out of any pandemic, and I guess especially this one, it's like, talk to me like I'm five, hold my hand. You know, I want to know what's open, what are the facilities like in your restaurant, how often is stuff being cleaned? Because there might be questions that we want to ask, but we're afraid to because they seem too basic or, or un, you know, too much focused on germs or what have you. So really coming out with the most basic, and this was on the Metro Vancouver call, um, really, really basic information because that's what people are going to want to start with. Seth, do you want to move on to the next question? Sure, I'm just going to give, give, um, I, did, did, did anyone else want to want to speak to that as well, just before? Uh, I, I will, I think just, just in, in general, from a, from a leisure traveler perspective, I think that, you know, depending on the different risk groups and, and whatnot, I think that price and safety will be important. I think that, that un unfortunately, you know, price will lead the way a lot of the, a lot of the times. I think that uh, larger branded restaurants and hotels, like they already have that inherent trust. So they're likely to do better on the other side of that. Where I, I see safety being the bigger issue during recovery is uh, with uh, corporate business associations, that type of thing, because I would be terrified to send any of my team anywhere where I thought they might get sick or something bad might happen to them um, because I'm A, I'm concerned about their personal well-being. But B, also, I'm responsible for the organization. I don't want to expose us in, uh, you know, uh, to potential uh, lawsuits either. So, I mean, there's, a, there's that part when you think of uh, a, a large organization, let's say, like Microsoft or Google sending a large number of people to uh, South by or something like that. Like, those are, those are major concerns for them. And I think those will need to be addressed before we see that large group travel come back. Uh, anyone else want to want to? want to provide some uh, feedback on that just, nope. just quickly about price you look at um, the leadership for professional convention management association PCMA Sheriff Caramat and Bruce McMillan they were both at tourism Toronto during SARS and they said the biggest takeaway was not to discount because it took them so long for the hotels to bring back rate um, integrity so really in terms it's rather than discounting all about value adds and just build on the value on top of value because once you stop start dropping rate, um, you know, we're talking years to bring it back sometimes. All right, I'm just gonna bring on um, Vivian here. Uh, Vivian, can you hear us here? Yes, I can. Um, so thank you everyone. Um, I love the candor and the sharing of what's on your minds. The question that I had was, you know, within the tourism sector or even the communities that you service, have there been discussion around pooling resources together, you know, sharing, you know, sharing functions, share, centralizing um, some things? I'm just curious if that you're seeing, noticing that trend. Uh, there has been, a, I'm, I'm determining how, how far open we want to pull the curtain on, on this kind of thing. I mean, there's definitely these discussions do, do happen especially with uh, small organizations um, really suffering for, for funding as, these, as you know, this carries out and it's sort of an indeterminate amount of time. So uh, I think that, that government, at, at whether it be municipal, provincial, or federal level, really appreciates the size and the scope of what uh, tourism means and they're, they're eager to, to a help. But at the same time, compared to other industries, like let's say, uh, oil or forestry, there are just so many different organizations and so many different uh, special interests involved. It is a challenge for them to kind of wade through that quagmire and, and come up with solutions that are going to benefit um, a lot of the smaller organizations uh, as it comes through. So the, the answer to your question is yes, it's happening. Uh, and I would say we have seen some progress, but on a personally, I think it's happening a little bit slower than I would like. And uh, I don't know, I don't want to, I don't, I don't want to say anything else on the record when it comes to that, but I think that gives you a little bit of an indication of, mm -hmm. of uh, the level of discussions that are taking place right now. Thank you, Chris. Does anyone else want to address Vivian's question or we're good with that one? Okay, Seth, over to you for the next uh, attend 
participant questions. So Haviz has typed this in. Um, Haviz, can you um, also, also introduce yourself, give, give just a quick, uh, you know, uh, what organization you're with? I'm just got that for the last two. Sure, am I on? Yeah, yeah. Yes. So um, I work for a company in Calgary. And uh, my question is, assume the eventual recovery will be uneven. Are there any travel types that you think um, will rebound quicker than others? So I'm thinking the travel typical ones are business, um, mice, VFR. How, how would you rank the likelihood of the back to normal for each of these? So just we talked earlier about how, you know, meetings, mice meetings in San Jose Congress's exhibitions will be um, in terms of large groups, probably the last. VFR, visiting friends and relatives, leisure, near proximity um, travel will be the first to come back. The business one's interesting. I'm already being asked to start flying. I don't want to fly, um, but at the same time, I want to make a living. So, um, you know, maybe I get on the plane with a hazmat suit, but um, I think business travel could come back more than some people think because people are eager to do business. Um, so it'll be interesting to see leisure versus business. But I think at the very beginning, it's anyone with money. You know, anyone that has the funds to be able to get in the car and go buy a hotel is going to get out on the road. And, I, and we have this conversation about defining, you know, the new traveler and how they're changed. Those first three to six months, I think a lot of us are going to be the same in what we're looking for. You know, we want some open space. We want to feel safe. We want to be able to connect with the community on a limited, um, you know, uh, example, we want to be able to retreat when we want because it's going to be a big shift coming out of nothing and reintroducing to society for some people. Um, there's this talk about younger people more likely to um, get out there. That could be, I don't know. Um, so that's just some sort of really surface level uh, thoughts about that. I think too, it's not necessarily corporate versus leisure versus to, to Greg's point. It's, you know, there, it's, it's more geographical as far as I can see it's, it, you know, it's going to kind of be like your sphere of influence almost. It's going to be, you know, we're going to start seeing movement within those two to three hour drive markets and they may just come for the day. They just, or the sneakers, you know, we're going to sneak out to, to go camping where nobody is and do it kind of under the, under the wire. And then things will start to open up and you'll see it spread more and more. But I, I think, you know, we do continue to have construction crews in Kamloops. We do continue to have government employees in Kamloops right now. So there is kind of that corporate traveler, but I think more so than sector is, is going to be geographical movement that will come first. Um, and, you know, it's just what we're feeling. Um, I'll, I'll jump in on this and, and great to hear from you, Hafiz. Hafiz and I worked together years ago. Um, from uh, working in, uh, in, in Banff and Lake Louise back in 2008-2009, uh, um, what we saw for the you know, urban and uh, resort areas was that, uh, sort of as Greg was alluding to, that, that top tier uh, traveler that, that's got money that wants to travel, they're going to come back. And so what we noticed in those hotels is that our suite product and our, our, our restaurants were full of those uh, type of travelers. Our base model uh, or our base rooms were empty, but in town, the, the hostels, the three stars were also full. So I think at either end of the spectrum, um, it's those leisure travelers that are either looking for that, that great deal to come back and experience something they wouldn't have been able to uh, prior to the pandemic or those, those that pent up demand for people that, that have that, uh, that have that uh, you know that that extra spending power and that big middle is sort of what's going to be missing for the the first few months. Um, where, where I have heard rumblings, and it's really going to depend on on how you know international travel rolls up. But uh, out of China, like Western Canada, just in general, is a is a is a very desirable uh, destination, especially the way that uh, we've been handling our pandemic. So there'll be, I think. Uh, when we look to tour business, there'll be strong demand out of there, but it's going to be very, very low rated. So there might be an opportunity for those for those fenced rates um, uh, to go to those to the that tour group as as the international borders start to open up. But that'd be my take on it. Anyone else? Or? Yeah, just I mean, even on the business side, like I said, you know, it's 
further, further down the road. But I think it really is going to pretend, uh, depend on sector. You know, anybody who's fully capable of operating remotely and, and really gotten used to this style will continue to do so as long as they can versus some of the other different industries who don't adapt as quickly or haven't preferred the adoption to virtual um, connections, they'll come back obviously sooner. So we know the Facebooks and the Microsofts, they're not coming back for a long time because they're fully capable of operating in this sphere um, and this is their comfort zone. So um, other industries potentially sooner. Yeah, to add to what Christina said is that we're hearing the same thing from those companies, which are some of our, our top corporate clients. And so we're looking at how do we pivot to maybe as well small, medium sized businesses that are still looking for uh, activities, team building, training, who might be getting together because still all this remote, remote um, uh, type of business is not the norm for them, even though they've had to adapt. They want to get back to the norm more more quickly than the larger organizations where it's very much ingrained in their culture. Okay, um, Connie, I think we we have just uh, we just uh, we're just going a little over. We have one more question here um, from uh, Beck. I'm just going to put Beck on the line here. Thank you very much uh, for the opportunity. It was definitely uh, very knowledgeable uh, panel um, and the experts in the industry um, you know sharing their ex uh, expert opinion um, so my question is as being a hotelier I, I, I do represent executive hotels and resorts uh, based out of Vancouver BC um, understanding that uh, the new norm was going to be different although everybody's uh, trying to be optimistic as optimistic as possible the new norm and the new business volume for the tourism industry will definitely shift um, and, and reduce um, it could be 30 percent it could be 40 or 50 percent we don't know yet uh, but uh, considering that you know the restaurants cannot survive uh, you know below 50 or 50 60 percent capacity of the clientele uh, hotels are going to be actually in a, in a more difficult situation considering that especially if they do not own the property or the real estate um, do you think that the, as a lot of the hotels um, may decide to repurpose their accommodation to be long-term residential accommodation um, considering that um, you know long-term residential uh, properties are actually in higher demand especially in metro vancouver area or toronto per se Oh, Greg, you need to unmute. So I can't speak to the economics of that. That's a, a you know real estate valuation and whatnot. But for those large hotels that have 50, 60 percent group versus transient that rely on that group business and destinations where, you know, I don't know Canada so much, but Phoenix, Fort Worth, Nashville that have over 50 percent group, if they're not getting those big 5,000, 10,000 groups, then those hotels can't remain solvent. So I don't see how they have any other opportunity, but specifically, specifically in Vancouver, where there's so much demand for um, residential, it would suggest that that's where we're going, um, you know, sooner than later. I don't know if that helps answer the question. Um, I'll, I'll jump in as well, just to some sort of region specific. The other that's sort of related to this um, off the top is also short-term rentals, which is something we haven't really talked about so much on this call. So they're Airbnbs. And what we've seen uh, in the past few, few months is uh, if you go on like Kijiji or Craigslist right now, there are anywhere from about 400 to 600 uh, furnished rentals for long-term available. Uh, which you would not have seen three, four months ago. This, so it's, it's, to me, that's, that's clearly, clearly Airbnb. And from my AirDNA uh, reporting that I get, it, we're showing that sort of, uh, for the first time since, well, since ever, really, we're starting to see a decrease in those units. So I think that that will kind of address some of that, that shorter-term demand. Um, and then I think part of that is also the, the additional demand for long-term housing is going to depend on how long our borders are closed to immigration, because that's the other thing that's sort of driven uh, that demand for, for uh, increased housing and, and housing prices in, in the lower mainland. And then, I mean, there's kind of a lot of layers to this. 
And then we've got a lot of the three, or not a lot, but some of the three star hotels on the Vancouver side that are now uh, turning into temporary housing for uh, the homeless population. So that's, it's going to be hard when it's time to say, time to check out. So I don't see that as being as probably as short term as it, uh, as they probably think. So I think there will be that demand and we're in a market that had a real shortage of hotel rooms based on our meeting space and the demand for the region. So hoping that the, uh, the owners, if they're able to remain solvent for two or three years, they're going to see that demand come roaring back and there's going to be uh, more demand for, for especially that uh, the, a full service hotel than I think there probably was uh, prior to this. Thank you, Chris. Um, I think we're definitely over time now. Um, and just as a final wrap up, I want to say thank you so much to all of our panel speakers. I think you've been very insightful and you've got everyone that's um, listening very engaged. So thank you. Um, as a final question, this is going to be a fun one, hopefully. Um, when social distancing is lifted, what are you personally going to do as your number one top thing on your list? Someone in the, like we asked this question in another meeting, he said he's going to run to the next, his favorite bar and have four pints of beer. So it could be anything that you like. I definitely like that one. Maybe play poker with my buddies. Poker's with your buddy tip. Okay. Greg? Um, just get on, get in the car with my wife and go f explore, you know, the state like I haven't before and check out all the places I've, you know, told myself I'd go and just start talking to people and, you know, sharing stories. I think just something as simple as that. Very nice. And Bev? Gonna hop on that ferry to Victoria and see my grandson. Oh, that big hug that's missed, right? Um, yeah. And Christina? Um, I mean this in the nicest way. I'm going to drop my daughter off to uh, her grandfather's house. <laughs> <laughs> and Chris? Uh, it is those small things. I'm going to take my family out and uh, take my mom out for a nice dinner. Very nice. And Tiff? Yeah, I was uh, catch up with some buddies and as Greg said, share some stories because it's been a while. It's been a while. And Seth, you want to share one too? I just, I mean, my, my thing is, you know, I want my in-laws here actually, because, you know, I, I've, I've mentioned this to Chris, and, <laughs> but I, I've got this big yard now, right? That needs a lot. <laughs> so I've got this credit to Air Canada. So, um, Hey, you know, I'm waiting, <laughs> I'm eagerly waiting. So it's, it's your own guest workers program. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> so, um, yeah, that's, yeah. Anyway. Mine is going to the garden center and picking up more plants to uh, add to my green room here. So <laughs> um, thank you so much. It's been very delightful um, having you answer all of the great questions that we've had. So again, thank you. And next week, for those who are listening still, um, May 6th, we have another social hour and we have a special guest speaker, Tom Singer, who is a expert in human connections. And the topic that he's going to focus on is social tightening um, in the face of uncertainty. And social tightening is really around the fact that we're so distant right now. We really need to tighten how we connect with our people. So the little conversations that we have or the little face-to-face -face that we can't do right now, there's still other ways that we can connect. So next week will be that focus. Um, we hope you can join us again. And to all of our panelists, um, thank you so much for your time today and for your insight. Have a great yeah. day. Thank you. thank you, everyone. And, um, you know, we'll, we'll be sending the recording out. And, um, yeah, this has been, been, been really great. Thank you. Okay. Thank Bye. you. Hi, everyone.